In about 1966, I asked Professor Kilburn, why is it that uh, whenever I open a computer science textbook, I get the American origins of computers, but the Brits are nowhere? So Tom took his pipe out of his mouth and said, those who need to know, do know. What was special about the baby was that such a computer can be used for a wide variety, perhaps almost an infinite variety of problems. It was an engineering test bed to test out the reliability of a memory invention. The central problem of the computer was recognised to be the problem of storage, and so the problem was quite simply brought to my notice. Cathode ray tubes were used widely during the Second World War for radar purposes. It's a way of displaying electronic signals on a screen that you can see. In the Williamson Kilburn storage tube, each little element of the screen was excited by the electrons and became charged. And each area of stored charge was made to represent a binary digit, a one or a zero. FC was a member of the telecommunication research establishment, which was called TRE. At the end of the war, he was offered a post at Manchester University, and he accepted with enthusiasm. And he took one of his uh, chaps, Tom Kilburn, and um, also asked for other bright young men, so I was the next one. It was a very exciting time, and there were a very small number of people who worked together very closely indeed. Tom Kilburn worked on the CRT memory and in about a year he'd actually moved from one bit of storage to 1,000 to 2,000 bits of storage. In December 47 what had arrived was a memory which could show static pictures. Now what we needed to check was that those pictures could actually change be recorded properly and do that at electronic speeds. That's really why the baby was built. It consisted of six foot six high post office racks, 23 inches wide, all around the laboratory. It was just a simple room. It had no air conditioning, so we always had windows open and things in those days, you know, to keep the temperature sensible. This was uh, the centre of Manchester, and uh, in with the fresh air came the dirt. Tom and I wore lab coats, a long coat down to your mid-thighs or knees. We avoided electric shocks by the classic artifice of keeping one hand in your pocket all the time and never to touch anything with both hands at once. We had a couple of technical staff who did the actual building. One of the best wiremen we had was um, Ida Fitzgerald, I think was her surname. She delivered the chassis wire to our uh, diagram and uh, we would look at it and say, oh dear, I didn't mean to do that. And we would uh, proceed to alter Ida's neat wiring. Tom Kilburn and uh, Jeff Tootle had been struggling for some days. The machine kept failing. Perhaps it was a wiring error or some soldered joint had failed. And then one day it all held together and worked not just once, but twice, but three times. And they realised we've made it. Finally, when we pressed the start button, it set off on this usual dance of death. And then suddenly it stopped. And there in the expected line was the expected answer, so we'd built a computing machine. We went out to lunch in the canteen as usual, and we were actually having lunch instead of having brought in sandwiches. That was the way we celebrated. What was needed now was to develop both the programming side and the arithmetic side to develop this universal machine. The baby was then expanded over the next 18 months to create the Manchester University Mark I computer. It was made about three times bigger. It had a lot more store and so on. By then, as far as the engineers were concerned, the baby computer was old hat. There's nothing left at all of uh, the baby or the expanded baby. In fact, the racks 
that the baby and the expanded baby were built on were used for the next machine that we built. In 1994, I realised that in four years' time, it would be the 50th anniversary of the baby computer. I put together a proposal as to how we could build a replica of that original machine. Tom Kilburn and I have both vetted it and approved it, and uh, as we said to each other when we saw it, well, this is uh, all wrong, of course, it's nice and clean. We completed the replica build and reenacted the running of the world's first programme. They operated the switches, the programme ran, they stood back, watched it on the display tube, saw the answer was correct, and then turned away and grinned at the audience, as if to say, there, we can do it again. Normally, the people who did the original work tend to fade into obscurity. In England, it's scientists and theoreticians who tend to get the glory. It's good that we remember the contribution of the electronic engineers to the information age, to the second industrial revolution, if you like. Manchester University now has a Tom Kilburn building, which in fact contains two laboratories known as the Tootill Laboratories. Computers are everywhere today, uh, in places unimaginable to the pioneers. The baby started off with a thousand bits of storage and now there is so much storage everywhere. You know, a million, million, million amount of storage. That, in my terms, is science fiction. How do you foresee um, the development of computers over the next decade? <laughs> I'm not really interested in computers. I made one and I thought one out of one was a good score, so I didn't make any more.